Thank you for coming to listen to this talk, which is about the evolution of solutions. And most of you and most people would understand that, you know, if we took a cup of tea and we put a small amount of sugar in it, it would dissolve and form a solution, right? Uh, and by that we mean that once it is dissolved, uh, you can't physically separate it. It's actually a, a solution. Yeah. In 1970, there was a really good uh, scientist called Benjamin at INCO who invented a different method for creating a solution because what he was trying to do uh, was to introduce very small oxide particles which are extremely stable inside metal so that you could make incredibly creep resistant metals. And he did it by internally oxidizing a thorium doped nickel based alloy. Now thorium is radioactive so it's not really the ideal material to use for making engineering alloys. So what is the other way of adding oxide to metal? And that oxide has to be very stable. If you add it to liquid, it will just float off. So he invented this process, which is known as mechanical alloying, in which you make a solid solution without any melting. So this is a, a simple illustration of what he did. Uh, so supposing that you want to add yttrium oxide to iron, and in addition, you want certain concentrations of titanium and aluminium, say. Then you put the mixture inside a ball mill, and the ball mill has some hard cast iron balls or whatever. As it rotates, it beats everything together, okay? And forces, effectively, forces all the elements into solution except the yttrium oxide particles, which are too stable. You then uh, take your powder and you extrude it in order to make a solid object. And you might give it some heat treatment uh, to get the structure that you want. But the yttrium oxide particles remain there, extremely fine nanometer scales, even before the word nanometer became fashionable. Okay? And uh, these are incredibly creep resistant materials. So the question that we wanted to ask is, when you do this, do you truly produce a solid solution? But before I go into that, I'll show you uh, some metallurgy of the material itself. Then I'll go into some revision thermodynamics, okay? And then explain how that applies to this mechanical alloying process. So the material that you produce uh, after extruding is very fine grains here and incredibly fine and stable yttrium oxide particles. And you cannot actually see the aluminum or titanium, presumably because it has gone into solution. Uh, this is after extrusion, so there's a lot of stored energy inside the material because the grain size is fine, uh, the dislocation density is uh, high, and so on. So even though the extrusion is done at something like 1200 degrees centigrade, uh, it's not high enough to stop uh, to recrystallize this material given that you have so many yttrium oxide particles in it. So if I pass this through a zone annealing furnace, that means I have an induction coil and I pull the bar through it, then I can actually get grains which are meters in length. Okay? So you know, when we make um, aircraft engine alloys, we make them as single crystals so that there are no boundaries. The alternative also is to make a directional microstructure so that the grain boundaries are parallel to the stress axis. Uh, and uh, this morning I saw you doing that by introducing potassium into the material and creating bubbles which pin the boundaries directionally. So this is obviously just a small section of a long rod which with the grain simply going all along the length of the boundary. So you not only have the yttrium oxide particles there, to stop recrystallization, dislocations, and so on, but you have your boundaries parallel to the stress axis, so the diffusion part uh, becomes minimal. You know, boundaries are, uh, have a lot of free volume, so diffusion is easier along a boundary, uh, but the problem is worse if you have boundaries which are normal to the stress axis. 
So the typical composition is 28% uh, chromium, uh, 5 aluminium and titanium, and the chromium and aluminium uh, also give the alloy oxidation resistance because, you, you know, obviously if you are going to use it at high temperatures, then uh, you need oxidation resistance. And this isn't really, it wasn't really designed for um, aircraft materials, but for making pipes which would be used to process biological waste at high temperatures. So you need extreme corrosion resistance, creep resistance, and oxidation resistance. Now, if before this recrystallization process you twist the pipe, okay, and you do that by uh, a special rolling mill where not everything is uh, perfectly parallel, then the pipe twists as it goes through that rolling mill, then you can even produce uh, helical structures along the length of the pipe. Okay? Now, this was done for fun. What we really wanted to do was to produce circumferential grains because the, uh, when a pipe is under pressure, uh, the biggest stresses are the hoop stresses, that means along the circumferential direction. So if we align the grains along here, then uh, you've got better properties. So that, is, uh, that, that has been done here. You can produce grains which are going around the circumference. And another application for this kind of... Uh, so uh, this was almost uh, maybe 30 years ago that we did this work after Benjamin invented this process. Okay, uh, And then these materials went out of fashion because they are actually very, very expensive to produce. The mechanical alloying process itself is, is a dramatic process. You, know, you cannot be in the room where this is going on on a large scale. It is so noisy and so forth. And the companies that produce it basically went bankrupt because you know, if you produce a very expensive material, it will have a very small application. But uh, these are coming back into fashion because in a nuclear reactor, uh, by transmutation, you produce uh, helium inside the steel. Okay? So there are elements which will, by alchemy, change into helium. So you know you can actually produce gold from iron if you want by transmutation, but it will be very expensive to do that and it will be radioactive. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> so, uh, so uh, producing hel uh, these helium bubbles are, are bad because they cause the material to swell and that can cause a nuclear accident. So for example, the very first uh, accident in uh, civilian reactors was actually in Britain, uh, in Sellafield. Um, and basically, you know, there was plutonium thrown out of the reactor in the surrounding regions because of the swelling of these fuel rods. So to prevent this swelling, you can put lots of particles inside the material, and those particles nucleate many, many bubbles. And if you have small and numerous bubbles, then the amount of gas that you can hold in the bubble is much larger than few large bubbles. So next time you try to blow up a balloon, you'll see that when the balloon is small, you have to work really hard to blow it up. When it gets large, it's very easy because the pressure when the bubble is small, is very, very large. So a small bubble can hold a lot more gas, and you solve the problem of swelling by introducing these oxide particles which nucleate lots of bubbles. So the fusion reactor I mentioned yesterday uh, will have neutron damage which is far, far greater than in the reactors we have at the moment, which are the fission reactors. 200 displacements per atom over the life of the material. Okay. So for these reactors, these materials are now coming back as possible uh, materials for the first blanket in the fusion program. Okay, so that's just uh, showing you that there is some relevance in what I'm going to say now. But what I really want to prove first is that this is a true solid solution as far as the other elements are concerned. And to prove that it's a true solid solution, I need to look at atoms, right? So can somebody tell me a technique by which I can look at atoms? Yeah. Sorry? Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's right. So the atom probe, for example. Uh, or what you guys call leap and so forth. Basically, you make a sharp needle, apply a very large electrical field, and uh, the imaging atoms then 
go along the parts of those electrical uh, contours and give you a magnification of 10 million times. And the sort of image that you see is as follows. Here, every single point there is an atom. So it's, it's quite easy to see atoms. And these circles are basically planes of atoms and so on. Now, notice there's a hole in the middle. That, uh, that isn't really a hole. But if you apply an electrical pulse, then you can pull out an atom. And you can measure the time of flight between two points and therefore work out what kind of an atom it is. Yeah, so that's time of flight mass spectroscopy. And when you look at an atom probe, whatever kind of atom probe it is, it will have some long object here. Okay? Uh, or it might actually curve around to save space. But basically, this is measuring the time of flight of individual atoms. And from that, working out a mass to charge ratio. And therefore, you can say, OK, this is a manganese atom, or this is a chromium atom, or hydrogen atom. So this kind of uh, work is now quite routine. So we did this on these mechanically alloyed materials. And I'm just showing you uh, a composition profile. So here, for example, is the concentration of iron atoms and the chromium atoms as, as we pull them out one by one. Okay? Now, there is no error in this analysis. Every single atom, I've got a time of flight. And you know, you've got to adjust the conditions so that the detector has time to recover before the next atom arrives. So there is no error. So would you call this a homogeneous solution or not? Yeah. So I've got two people saying homogeneous, even though the concentration is doing that. So why, why would you call it homogeneous? It's homogeneous, but not uniform. So it may be a solution everywhere, right. but not uniform in concentration. Right. So let me pose uh, the question differently. So this is the USA. So we have Republicans and Democrats. <laughs> okay. So if I take a sample of four people, I might find that three of them are Republicans and one of them Democrat. If I take a sample which is slightly bigger, I might come nearer to the true answer. So when you're picking out uh, a cluster of 50 atoms, uh, you will get differences between your samples. It doesn't necessarily mean that this is a heterogeneous solution. What you have to do is you have to design on a computer a random distribution of atoms, then pick out 50 atoms at a time and see what the composition you, you get and compare with your experimental measurement. And if those two distributions compare, then it's a random solution. Okay, so here, for example, we have this uh, binomial distribution uh, in white, where I'm picking out samples of 50 atoms at a time. And I will not get the same answer every time I do that. Okay? Uh, from that, I plot a frequency distribution, which will look like that. And the black is the experimental distribution that we observe. And you can see that there's nothing to write home about the difference between the experimental and the measured value. Okay. So this process has truly produced a solid solution. Okay. So we now uh, do some revision thermodynamics. right? And uh, it will be for a binary solution. And let's say we have two components, A and B, here. So the total number of atoms is capital N. And the total number of A atoms is small n. And therefore, the number of B atoms is capital N minus small n. Everyone happy with that? OK. Right, so what do we mean by a solution? First of all, I've got my A atoms and B atoms. If I just consider these particles together and work out the free energy, then it will be between the free energy of pure A and pure B. It will be a weighted mean of the concentration of A or the concentration of B. So this is called a mechanical mixture. So the atoms, are not, atoms of A are not really feeling the presence of the B atoms and vice versa. It's just a mechanical mixture of large lumps of A and B. And therefore, the free energy is some mean value between the, uh, between the free energy of A and of B. 
A solution means they start to feel each other's presence, and therefore the free energy of the solution will be different from that of a mechanical mixture. Yeah? Okay, so how do they feel each other's presence? That's the next bit of the story. So supposing that, uh, you know, the atoms are indifferent to what their neighbors are. Uh, in other words, you know, if I break an AA bond and a BB bond and form two AB bonds, there's no change in energy. Supposing that is the case, there still is a reduction in free energy when you mix them. And that's because of something called entropy. So let me illustrate what we mean by entropy. Supposing you have a cylinder, and in that cylinder I put some atoms of gas, an ideal gas because they don't care who their neighbors are. Uh, which of these situations is more likely, that all the atoms end up on one side of the cylinder, or they are all distributed inside the whole cylinder? It's a question for you. If you are observing the system, which one would you see? You yeah, th th this, this one, right? Because, why is that? Because it is much more likely than this. This is perfectly possible that all the atoms move in one direction and end up in one half of the cylinder. But the probability of all the atoms moving at the same time to fill half the cylinder at a pressure of B is just ridiculously small. <coughs> so it is possible, but this will be much more probable, and therefore we say that this system has a higher entropy. And nature favors a higher entropy. So, you know, whatever we do, we will actually increase the entropy of the universe. You think you are organizing yourself, but in doing that, you are damaging other things, and therefore the entropy increases. So this is the meaning of entropy, uh, that the arrangements which are more likely are favored. And uh, Boltzmann expressed this uh, very well with an equation which is on his gravestone. You know, this is an epitaph. So entropy is given by a proportionality constant times logarithm of the number of arrangements possible when you have a, a system of independent particles. Okay. So if I, if I know the number of ways in which I can arrange the atoms, I can work out the degree of disorder or the entropy. Actually, you know, people didn't believe in the particulate nature of matter at the time Boltzmann was deriving this. There were two, two teams, you know, the people who believed that there were atoms and others who did not. And he got so depressed that he actually committed suicide. Yeah. So, you know, some people feel really strongly about science. Okay, so what I'm going to do is now I'm going to take my capital N atoms and arrange them onto a lattice and work out how many possible different arrangements there are, because that W defines the entropy. So here is a lattice, and I've got a single atom that I've placed on that lattice. Uh, and we've got a total of capital N atoms. So how many possible ways of arranging this single atom on this lattice, which has capital N sites? Capital N, right? Here we go. Perfect answer. How about when I place the second atom? How many different ways of placing the second atom? Yeah. So um, the first atom, you know, there are capital N ways. And of getting a, an arrangement for a pair of atoms is capital N into N minus 1. Okay? Because there were N minus 1 sites available after placing the first atom. But Atoms don't actually have labels. So, you know, an arrangement where I start with atom 1 here and place atom 2 there is exactly the same as atom 2 over here and 1. So I've got to divide this by 2. So there are n into n minus 1 divided by 2 possible ways of placing a pair of atoms on a lattice which has capital N sites. If I now uh, go to the third atom, we just simply follow the same procedure capital N, N minus 1, N minus 2, and 3 factorial represents the fact that 6 of these arrangements cannot be distinguished. 
okay? because the atoms do not have these labels. So I continue this process until I've placed all the A atoms, and it follows that you know, the B atoms must go on the remaining sites. And basically, I'm now expanding that equation to deal with all n minus n, uh, all of the A atoms. And if you simplify this, then it's capital N factorial over the number of A atoms factorial times the number of B atoms factorial. So this is the total number of arrangements that I can make when I have small n A atoms and capital N minus small n B atoms to arrange. Now these are generally speaking large numbers because uh, you know, a mole of atoms is 10 to the power of 23. So taking a factorial of something that as large as 10 to the power of 23 is a bit boring. <laughs> okay? So there is a rule known as Stirling's approximation which, which works very well when we have large numbers. And Stirling's approximation is that the logarithm of y factorial is equal to y log y minus y, okay? when y is very large. So if you apply this uh, to uh, the total number of arrangements we have here, and then use Boltzmann's law, then this is the classical equation of the entropy of mixing, where x is the mole fraction of A atoms. That means small n divided by capital N. And 1 minus x, of course, is the mole fraction of B atoms. And this is Avogadro's number, which is 6.023 times 10 to the 23, because that's a mole. And this is the constant that Boltzmann derived, k log w. So this equation is very easy to remember because it's simply 1 minus x log 1 minus x and x log x. And if I have more components, then you simply say, you know, xa log xa plus xb log xb plus xc log xc, etc. So this is entropy. And if I multiply it by minus t, I get a free energy. So even if the atoms are indifferent to what their neighbors are, you will get a reduction in free energy because these arrangements are more likely than having all the atom, A atoms on one side and all the B atoms on the other side. And that is the reason. Uh, so this is how the entropy of mixing changes as a function of concentration. It is at a maximum when you have equal numbers of A and B atoms. And this is how the free energy of mixing, which is minus T, minus the temperature times the entropy of mixing, changes as a function of the concentration when the atoms are indifferent to who their neighbors are. And you can see that the minimum free energy is when you have equal numbers of A and B atoms. Okay. So this is purely uh, a little bit of revision of solution thermodynamics. And I've only considered the entropy of mixing so far. So this is our free energy of mixing, which is minus T times the entropy of mixing. And that gives us this equation here. But the free energy of mixing of atoms consists of more terms than just the entropy of mixing. So here's our entropy of mixing equation. There might be other entropies, for example, vibration of atoms or, or, or other, other terms. And then there is this term, which is the enthalpy of mixing. So initially I said that you know, we have a solution in which the atoms don't care who their neighbors are. But there is no such solution. Okay? These solutions are called ideal solutions. There is no solution in which you won't have a change in bond energy if you take a pair of A atoms, break them apart, pair of B atoms, break them apart, and make AB bonds. So we need to consider this term as well. So the way in which we define a bond energy is if I take an A atom here and an A atom a long distance away, and I bring them closer and closer together, then there's a change in energy. And at some point, when they get too close, they start to repel each other, and therefore you get a rise in energy. So the bond energy is this term here, minus 2 epsilon AA for an AA bond. And of course, you know, this, uh, this curve itself is very famous because you know, if you differentiate it, you can get the modulus. And this immediately tells you 
that the modulus is only constant at small strains, because this is not a straight line, it's a curve. Yeah? It also shows you why thermal expansion happens, because if I increase the temperature, then basically the energy here, the atom increases its energy by the thermal energy, but this curve is not symmetrical, so it goes the mean value of distance will not be along this vertical line, but somewhere here, and therefore you get thermal expansion. If this curve was a perfect parabola, you would not get any th thermal expansion. So there's a lot of information in this curve. Okay, so let's work out the change in energy when we take AA bonds, BB bonds, and create AB bonds. So, the probability of finding an A atom, if its concentration is 1 minus x, is simply 1 minus x. So, you know, if I just pick out an atom from the solution, then the probability of finding an A atom is 1 minus x, the, the concentration. And to find another A atom is also 1 minus x. So this is 1 minus x squared. Okay, so that's the probability of finding two A atoms. Uh, and uh, this represents uh, n A times 1 minus x represents the number of A atoms. And this is a coordination number. So, you know, you can have bonds in three different directions, for example, if it's a cubic lattice. Uh, and we have this factor of half because we can't distinguish these two atoms. Yeah, if I started from the first A atom, and looked at the second A atom, I could also start from the second one and look backwards. So we don't want to count this bond twice. And on similar logic, this is the number of BB bonds, because the concentration of B is X. That's the probability of finding a B atom. And to find another B atom next to it is also X, and therefore we have X squared, uh, the Avogadro's number, and this is uh, the coordination number and the half again, because we can't distinguish these two. And we can form A, B bonds and B, A bonds. So we don't need to worry about the factor of a half. This is the probability of finding an A atom and a B atom and the usual term here. So now I've got the number of bonds defined as a function of concentration. And I can simply work out my enthalpy of mixing by saying that, look, this is the change in energy when I take an AA bond, a BB bond, and break that uh, and create two AB bonds. And I multiply this by this, this by this, this by this, add it all up, and I get a simple equation here where Avogadro's number, coordination number, concentration of A, concentration of B, and the change in bond energy. Okay. So that defines the chemical interaction between atoms. Uh, which also contributes to the free energy of mixing. And, you know, uh, the analogy that I use that the atoms are indifferent to each other, supposing they hate atoms which are not of their own kind, then that will lead to clustering of atoms. So you will find A-rich regions and B-rich regions. On the other hand, if they prefer to be next to atoms who are different, then you will get ordering of atoms. And that is expressed um, by looking at the magnitude of these two terms, this is a case where AB bonds will be favored, okay? because the sum of these two is greater than for unlike bonds. And this is a case where clustering would be favored. That means the solution, you know, if you give it half a chance uh, it, at low temperatures when the entropy of mixing uh, term is small, because it's multiplied by temperature, at low temperatures, the solution will tend to separate out into A-rich and B-rich regions. And we saw many examples of this when the students were presenting their work, where you know, uh, the chromium concentration fluctuation developed in the material that you are looking at. And that's driven by the fact that AA bonds are preferred to AB bonds. So these are the different free energy of mixing curves we get as a function of whether the atoms uh, prefer to be next to unlike atoms or like atoms. This is the case where ordering is favored. That means that you like A atoms to have B atoms next to them. And this is a case 
where clustering is favored. So here, for example, we favor A-rich solutions and B-rich solutions. Okay. So frankly speaking, you know, this completely, uh, these principles completely define the nature of solutions that we look at every day, whether it's in the solid state, liquid state, gaseous state, etc. All you need to know about thermodynamics. I'm exaggerating, but this is the essence of the problem. OK, so going back to our original problem, we've got large lumps of A and large lumps of B, and we are going to bash them about until they form a soli solid solution. And I said to you that when they are present as large lumps, uh, you basically have a free energy which is a mechanical mixture of the two, weighted by the free energies of the pure substances. And you know, even if we have large lumps of particles, there is still an entropy term because I can arrange those particles in different ways. And W will be the number of ways in which I can arrange the particles. So I could look at the process of mechanical alloying by saying that, look, I'm starting off with large particles. And here, we only have a mechanical mixture. As I break up these particles, I've got more particles, so more possible number of arrangements. And here, I have even more particles, even more particles, until I eventually have a solid solution. And what I want to do is to generalize that Boltzmann equation so that we are dealing not with atoms, but with particles. And the number of atoms in the particle can change as the mechanical alloying process uh, evolves. So this truly is about the evolution of the solid solution and what determines whether this happens or not. So when we had atoms, we basically derived this as the number of arrangements. But when we have particles, these equations must have a number which tells us how many atoms there are in the A particles and how many atoms there are in the B particles. And you follow exactly the same procedure as we did before. And you turn up with this equation instead, instead of this one, okay? where in this equation now we also have the term m, which represents the number of A atoms in each particle. Okay? So if it's a large particle, then we have uh, m is large. And this is the number of B atoms in the particle of B. So this is the number of ways in which you can arrange those particles. If I take the logarithm of that by applying uh, the Boltzmann equation, and multiply by k, then I will have the entropy of mixing. And the equation is a little bit longer than before. But if I reduce m to a single atom, then it converts to the familiar equation for the classical entropy of mixing. But this tells us how the entropy of mixing evolves as the particles start from large particles and go on to small particles. So it's a more general form of the entropy of mixing equation. So does x now represent the number of particles? Sorry? Does x now represent the number of particles? No, it's uh, the mole fraction. It's still the mole fraction. Um, and that's why we have terms, uh, terms here and so on. So if you count the number of atoms, it'll still come out as correct, the total number of atoms. But if I replace m by 1 for both ma and mb, then we recover the classical equation. So we can now ask the question, you know, we all talk about nanomaterials and nanoparticles and so on. At what point should you classify a particle as a nanoparticle? You know, really, there has to be some physics to that. How small is small? Well, when they start to feel each other's presence, right? You know, if you have a large particle, then it's only the atoms at the boundary which notice other atoms. But when you have small particles, a large fraction of those atoms will notice. So the way to think about this is if I plot the free energy of mixing as a function of the size of the particles, and you know, a typical driving force for a diffusional transformation is about 10 joules per mole. So this is about 10 joules per mole. So if I take that, then when the particles are about 1,000 atoms in size, 
they seriously feel each other's presence. Okay? So that truly you can think about as a small particle. But when they are, you know, uh, a grain size which is uh, 10 micrometers, uh, really, frankly, there's no, no effect, no contribution to the entropy of mixing. Okay? So this is called a small size because the atoms in the air particle actually feel substantially the presence of the atoms in the B particle. Everyone happy with that? Okay. Now, we have uh, to calculate also the enthalpy of mixing. We get a question here. Oh, sorry. Here, 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 here. Yes. Partially happy. <laughs> <laughs> good, good, good. Yeah. I think it's a very good example of the thorium oxide <coughs> particles that you have in your metal alloy. Uh, I think I told you thorium oxide was the first dopant in tungsten as well. Right. And yet the underwent post ripening. That's why they were ultimately not used. Right. But so even we get post ripening when the particles are a micron or bigger. And so there's a small solubility of I guess they trip whatever or oxygen in solution. They feed each other. That's right. So uh, coarsening uh, depends, as you said, uh, not just on the surface energy but also on the solubility of the material inside the matrix. And yttrium has a very, very low solubility inside uh, iron or in nickel. And that's why, you know, even after service at very high temperatures, they don't coarsen very much. And that's why Benjamin wanted to introduce those particles. But in tungsten, uh, you're right, quite right, you also have thorium. But it's, isn't it for electron emission or something like that, well, work function? You can do that too, but yeah. in, the, in the beginning, they wanted to dope to stabilize the gray boundaries. And it was ultimately not successful because after like several hours at 2,500, right. it was too much for possible ripening, and then you lost the, the film string. Okay. Okay, uh, so um, apart from the entropy of mixing, you will also have changes in bond strength as the particles touch each other. Okay, but in the case of particles, uh, it's only the atoms at the interface between particles which will change their bond strength. The part atoms inside the particle still don't feel the bond strength change because they are only next to A atoms or only next to B atoms. So the problem is slightly different than when we looked at a solution that it's only the atoms at the interface which feel the presence uh, of breaking an AA bond, a BB bond, and replacing it by an AB bond. So this equation that we derived for an atomic solution is not applicable because that deals with every single atom inside your solution. We need to scale that equation by the amount of interface we have in the volume of the material because it's only that region that will fill, feel the presence of other atoms. So to cut a long story short, this is the uh, amount of surface we have per unit volume which will be related to the inverse of the size of the particles. So the smaller the particle you make, the greater the surface area you have per unit volume of material. Yeah? So you know it's exactly the same as a fine grain size. There will be much more grain boundary per unit volume than a coarse grain size. Uh, and the ent enthalpy of uh, m uh, mixing will depend on the amount of surface per unit volume and this interfacial energy term. And as the particle size becomes smaller and smaller, this tends towards infinity. So something is not right. You know, if, if this tends towards infinity, then interface energy will oppose the formation of a solution. Right? Because, you know, the enthalpy of mixing will become infinite. Yeah, if you're creating more and more interfaces, then that interface energy is a cost. And as you go to a smaller and smaller grains, this term, which is one upon the grain size, will shoot up to infinity. So you will never form a solution. 
So here, that's the surface, mm. that, not entropy. No, no, we are considering the surface. Yeah. Because the interface has a structure, you know, it has dislocations or whatever, and that has a cost, that's a defect. And that's expressed in the interfacial energy per unit area. So now we have to think actually completely differently from normal. We have to think uh, the reverse of the process of nucleation. So when a particle is very small, it's coherent. Yeah. It's only when it grows bigger that it becomes semi-coherent and then you have lost even the dislocation structure and it's incoherent. So in going from coherent to semi-coherent to incoherent, you increase the interfacial energy. So if you now think in reverse, when we are going from a large particle to a small particle, eventually uh, you will become fully coherent and lose all interfacial energy. Sigma is actually a function of the size of your particle. It's not a constant. And I can just illustrate that to you. So normally we think like this, that when a particle nucleates, because it's small, you, you still have coherency. That means these lattice planes are continuous across the precipitate, even though they might be distorted, because the lattice type is different for a precipitate than a matrix. And as it, as it grows, these trains become intolerable. Right? So you get the creation of dislocations, which relieve these elastic strains. So this is no longer coherent, but incoherent. And it has a higher interfacial energy than that case. So in mechanical alloying, we go in the reverse direction. We start from large particles, and we go to a small particles, and therefore we must recover coherency. And of course, you know, you can exaggerate this to a ridiculous extent that if the particle is just one atom, clearly it does not have an interface around it. Okay? So logically, uh, it's absolutely right to say that when the particle becomes small, you will gain coherency. And therefore, it's possible to form a solution. It's only if you assume that sigma here is constant that solution formation is impossible. Now, when we nucleate a particle, there is a barrier, isn't there? Barrier to nucleation. Yeah, we call it the activation energy. Because, you know, the surface, per unit vo uh, surface area per unit volume is large when the particle is small. So the cost of that surface is greater than the free energy change. So we get a barrier to nucleation. Everyone familiar with that? So if we go in the reverse direction, we still have that barrier to jump. Yeah. And when you put together the calculation for the entropy of mixing and enthalpy of mixing, sure enough, there is a barrier to go back towards a small particle size. Okay? So in mechanical alloying, there will be a barrier to the formation of a solution, just like when we go from a small particle to a large particle during nucleation. So there's a, and the nature of this barrier also depends on the nature of the solution. So this, there is a single barrier when A atoms prefer to be next to B atoms, but when they don't like to form a solution, when they like to cluster, there will be another term which opposes the formation of the solution, and that is that we're really, really forcing atoms to be next to each other when they don't want to be. Okay? So in that case, you can see there's another barrier when you're forcing atoms to be next to neighbors that they don't want to be next to. You know, mechanical alloying is actually forcing things together. So, this is an activation barrier, and the last stages of mechanical alloying are very difficult to achieve a solution, if that is what you're after. Can I just ask, yeah. there's a hugely abrupt threshold in 100. Hmm. And the cube root of 100 is about 5. Is there right. magic about 5 atoms? Yes, uh, uh, so I mentioned earlier that you know, when you get to individual atom, there's no concept about an interface. Yeah. But it, but it looks like really that happens at a particular group, which right. is almost <coughs> 5 atoms in the direction. Yeah. 
So, of course, you know, the actual value will depend on what I put for the bond energies and so forth. Yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, I'll skip this slide. Now, uh, there, is a, there is a long standing paradox in thermodynamics, right, which we teach everybody that the free energy curve for mixing should have infinite slope at the pure axis. Okay, so it has infinite slope but a constant intercept which is the free energy of pure B or of pure A. And the reason for this is that, you know, supposing you have completely pure B and you put a single atom of A into that, then I've suddenly got a huge number of ways in which I can put that A atom. Yeah? So the configurational entropy of mixing has a very large jump at a very small concentration. So you get an infinite slope here. But you know, this is not correct because you cannot have a concentration less than one atom. You know, when you think about these particles and you go to smaller and smaller particles, you can't have a particle size smaller than one. So this slope is actually finite because let's assume this is one atom, then this is not an infinite slope. Yeah. It's only an infinite slope if you assume that concentration is continuous, which it is not. You require one atom to change the concentration. So this paradox is not going to, uh, the solution to this paradox is not going to change life as we know it. But it's interesting. Yeah? So we need to think about a solution as a discrete, uh, discrete concentration variation, atom by atom. Now, the mechanical alloying uh, case that I've studied today is just one example of what happens. When we severely deform a material which has more than one phase, it's effectively mechanical alloying. You're going to mix up those phases until you get a homogeneous mixture. The phases will disappear. And there are many examples of this. So for example, uh, when we do wire drawing of politic wire, the cementite goes into solution. And you're left with ferrite containing a large carbon concentration. When you have a railway wheel going over a rail, it induces stresses under the surface repeatedly. And you mechanically mix everything in that region. And when you look at it in an optical microscope, that region will not etch because it's homogeneous. Okay? So it's basically a mechanically alloyed region. So here is a, a case where you start with martensite and then you heat it and you produce a mixture of ferrite and martensite. This is a classical dual phase steel. And we were working with uh, uh, a steel company called Kobe Steel in those days, yeah? where we wanted to produce a wire which was incredibly strong. Actually, they had done most of the work on this and we were just doing the understanding part of it, as is usual, okay? The industry invents the thing first, and then we try and understand it. So the idea was to produce a wire which is uh, as strong as five and a half gigapascals, and they did it yeah, by putting very severe deformation into the uh, wire, and starting with the mixture of ferrite and martensite. And we looked at the structure of this uh, using the atom probe, and can you see these dark lines here? Those are actually boundaries. So. The deformation is such that, you know, if you take 50 grams of steel and you draw it out into two kilometers, that's the strain that's put in to create this level of strength. And you produce very fine wire, which is used for cutting silicon wafers and so forth. Uh, and of course, we can analyze this. Uh, we can pull the atoms out and see what happens. And all of this is a homogeneous solution. We had ferrite, we had martensite, but the deformation mixed them up completely. And here is a picture of this material. It's called cipher, scientific iron, okay? And it is five and a half gigapascals strong, but it still is ductile. You can tie a knot with it. You can't tie a knot with carbon fiber, okay? Right, now, 
I'm going to finish with some equations again. Right? So this was the equation for the entropy of mixing when we have uh, A and B atoms or, or any number of atoms if you have this uh, subscript I. But you know, the form of this equation appears in many, many different scenarios. So supposing you have a structure in which you have two different phases and you define the volume fraction of each of those phases, then a term which is very similar to this entropy of mixing here defines the how heterogeneous that solution is. Okay. So these are the volume fractions of the phases. And you know, if you only have one phase, then it's very homogeneous. But if you have phases which are in equal volume fraction, then that's the most heterogeneous microstructure you can get. So if you're looking at, for example, scatter in toughness, you measure the toughness, you do the test many times, and you get scatter. If you have a heterogeneous material, then you will get a larger amount of scatter, right? So if I plot the uh, measure of the scatter against, we'll call this microstructural entropy okay. here, there is a correlation because the more heterogeneous the structure is, the greater will be the scatter in toughness. Okay. Similarly, there is another term uh, in information theory, which is called the Shannon entropy. And it has a very similar form, where this is the probability of a particular kind of event in your information. Now, I don't fully understand this. Uh, you know, how you can have entropy in information. And the story, whether it's true or not, is that Shannon derived this equation to represent the uh, quality of information. And then he went to a colleague and said, look, what should I call this? And his colleague told him, call it entropy, because nobody understands entropy anyway. <laughs> and that's, that term is stuck. And the way I would explain it is that, look, if you write your PhD thesis and it's completely uniform, in other words, you know, the probability of one kind of word is too high, then it will be a boring thesis to read. But if you have all the events with equal probability, then it will have the most heterogeneous uh, information in it and, you know, the reader will keep attention to it. So with that, I will end today's lecture, <laughs> OK? <laughs> and I'll also promise there will be no equations in tomorrow's lecture. <laughs> mm. Is there going to be a test after? <laughs> I can arrange that for you. <laughs> OK. <laughs> OK. There's some questions. There's some comments. So in the beginning, you're talking about producing a random mixture of elements on the metal sublattice. But you also want to have the oxide particle. And you'd like to have, some, in the ideal world, you'd like to have a high degree of order between the oxide particles so they're not, they don't exhibit the distribution that you showed. You want to avoid even statistical clusters and have ordering. Is it, so, is it possible using these mechanical alloying strategies to produce uh, different drives for ordering on different elements of the microstructure? Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, I, I do, actually. Um, and this morning, we had a discussion exactly about this. Uh, so the mechanical alloying process is quite brutal. Yeah? And it produces more or less a uniform dispersion. But then if you deform the material afterwards, then you will tend to get alignment of those particles. Uh, so the secondary operation yeah. puts the desired order in part right. of the system. I see. Uh, but in, in your case, uh, you know, you produce it, uh, he produces particular dispersions of bubbles by making a, effectively a composite material. And then you can get you know, long grains and so on. Yes, that is for a solid that is 
almost in in solution, yet it's believed to has it, it's believed to be so insoluble that you can't even measure in parts per million what the solubility is. Right. But I think uh, maybe you'll have the answer there. A, a potassium atom has about the volume of five tungsten atoms. And so it's a co perhaps a coherent particle, but it has a very high strain energy around it that supplants the uh, missing grain boundary. It okay. gives you a higher entropy. I didn't realize, you know, that potassium is five times the size of tungsten. Yes, very large. Yeah. The, the radius is about two times larger of the cube that uh, yeah. five to six times the body. What is the solubility of potassium and tungsten that's used for these, or the concentration? It's never been measured. There is. No, I think, I don't think he means the solubility. I think he means what's the alloy composition. How yeah. much? Well, oh, the actual composition. They typically have uh, 100 to 300 ppm in the volume. Locally in planes, it's a higher concentration when it's, the puppets are great. These were invented by Coolidge, right? Yes. Well, well, invented or discovered. Coolidge developed the deformation process. Subsequent, Coolidge then tried thorium oxide, and then some co workers developed other dopants which work better than very much So you know, this, the story of invention with Coolidge is interesting because he filed a patent on this. He was given a medal by the General Electric Corporation for the importance of the patent. The patent was then denied retroactively. He lost the suit, and so he gave back the prize to GE. Really? Which is astonishing that uh, somebody would feel that level of integrity to give the prize back. It's a really interesting story. So, so, so they say discover rather than invent. Why was he patent disqualified? It's a longer story, but at the time that argument was that processing can't be patented, only the initial or final stage. I think the argument was he patented the process of ductilizing tungsten. That was the patent issue. Brittle material was made ductile by his process. Then in a lawsuit against the General Radio Company, they demonstrated that previously somebody had made tungsten single crystals, which were totally ductile. And that means Coolidge did not ductilize the tungsten. That it was always ductile. It was always ductile. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Can I ask a question? Yeah. So is there information in this analysis that helps you choose the right starting size for the powder when you're going to mechanically alloy. So, because grinding is so energy intensive, it, it's tremendous. It's not just loud, but you're using many, many watts to do this. And so, I presume that there would be an efficiency to choosing the right initial condition. Yes, I, I think you're right. Uh, you, you know, if you know the uh, effective enthalpy change. And these days, you know, these data are available, and uh, the entropy of mixing and so forth. Then you should be able to work out the most uh, efficient way of doing it. You know, what's the right starting particle size? But that's not a problem with that. No, I, I, I don't think anybody reads this paper. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. I doubt that. Um, how much of the ductility of the wire do you think is simply due to its size? Are there any size effect issues with that? No, no, that's a very good uh, point. Um, you're absolutely right. If you made this material bigger, you would not get that ductility. Yeah. But it's not possible to make this bigger, in fact, because when you deform it, yeah, it, it basically is fine. So just to give you an idea of how fine this wire is, uh, you know, uh, women's stockings uh, have a thread which is about nine denier. That's the unit that used for defining. This is eight denier in thickness. Hmm. The, the regular solution model is something that is sort of the first step away from ideal solution. But I had heard that there really wasn't any 
particular significance to that particular formulation, and uh, uh, it just lent itself to easy mathematics. Is, is, that, is that a fair statement? That's absolutely correct, because there's a contradiction in everything I've said. The entropy of mixing is calculated by randomly putting atoms, right? Uh, but if you have a change in bond energy, then that's not reasonable. The atoms will not be randomly dispersed in general. Yeah? So the entropy of mixing assumes there is a non-random distribution, if it's finite, if entropy of mixing. But the entropy of mixing term is for an ideal solution. So the next stage, uh, actually the theory exists, but the complexity is enormous. It's called quasi-chemical theory, where you work out the entropy of mixing for a non-random mixture. And that, that exists, you know, and some people call it cluster variation method, for example. What is the sugar to the solution? That's uh, on the way to that? Yeah. Yeah, there, there is something called a subregular solution. I've just forgotten what it means. I think I'm surprised that how that idea of the regular solution still crops up in the literature. Right. Today. Well, we put it in all our teaching, you see. We, we first explain ideal solution, then we explain the regular solution, you know. There's a great advantage to teach simple things, regardless of <laughs> <laughs> Especially when the next most realistic uh, treatment is so complicated. Yeah, and you know, you can ask an exam question, what are the approximations? Yes, <laughs> okay. It sort of connects to what you said yesterday, which is sometimes you do not have to have all the complexity to get enough information to right. make a good decision. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I have two questions. My first question is: You talked about the nanometer size and nano size. Uh, only, only the atoms at the interface at the interface of the uh, atom at other point, right? Mm -hmm. So, the, the type of interaction that matters in this situation. My second question is: uh, You talk about the interface uh, entropy, which is a uh, competition between the entropy and the stress. stress. There are term. So if I have a material with, which is nanocomposite with coincides in, uh, in, in, in with uh, with uh, uh, coherent uh, semi with incoherent interfaces, should I call it metastable phase? Uh, so your first question was, you know, the meaning of a nanoparticle. Is that right? Yeah. And uh, you know, unfortunately, the word nano became very popular. And sometimes there are papers written with three nanos in the title. Yeah? And there's even a subject called uh, nano bio and so on. So some people, you know, they will say 100 micrometers is nano because it's 0.1. Um, no, it's 100 nanometers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> OK. Uh, and others will genuinely focus on a very small size. But we need some kind of an objective method. You know, if, if you have a particle which is 100 micrometers, then most of the atoms are not feeling their surroundings. Yeah. So an objective definition would be that you know, it's a nanoparticle when its size actually matters. Yeah. Uh, and the second question I've forgotten. Uh, just. Uh, you talked about, uh, when you, you said uh, there is an interfacial entropy, which is uh, the competition so, you know, if we start with large particles and you have interfaces which are random interfaces because we haven't joined the particles up in a particular way, then the interfacial energy is high. If you assume that that remains constant as the particles become small, then it's impossible to form a solution because the amount of surface per unit volume increases as the particle size becomes smaller towards infinity. And that will oppose you know, you're creating more defect in the form of boundaries. That has a cost which prevents solid solution. So the only way to form a solution is if you gain in coherency during the process. Okay, very good questions. With that, uh, thank our speaker again, and the third lecture tomorrow, same time, same place. Thank you very much. <laughs>